As we begin with astronomy, the most important place for you to start is first to talk to the primary teachers and find out who was teaching astronomy and what topics were covered and review the K3 tape if necessary and then review these primary astronomy concepts with your students. In particular, it's important that they understand that first basic primary motion of the Earth, the fact that the Earth turns counterclockwise on its axis once a day. Now think of this, a pendulum, uh, a weight hanging from a string, suspended over the North Pole and swinging back and forth. And underneath the weight is a circle of little pegs set up. And as the pendulum swings in one direction back and forth and the Earth turns underneath it, those pegs will get knocked down. And the order they get knocked down in will be determined by whether the Earth is turning counterclockwise or clockwise. And this was developed by a man named Henry Foucault in the 1800s. It's called a Foucault pendulum and you see these at museums and planetariums throughout the United States. Now let's continue with the model that we developed at the primary level. And this time, let's talk about the motion of the moon around the Earth. And here we're using a styrofoam ball that's painted dark on one side and light on the other, and our globe of the Earth with the little paper people that are taped on at various locations, and a light bulb which is going to represent the sun, so we know where the light's coming from. That's very important. Now, first some facts about the moon. First thing is that if you had a big balance out in space and you put the moon on one side and the earth on the other, the earth would definitely be heavier. In fact, it would take about 81 moons to balance the mass of the earth. Now since the moon is a smaller object, much less massive than the earth, the force of gravity on the moon will also be less. It comes out to be about one-sixth as much. So if you flew to the moon and walked on the surface, you will only be attracted by a force of one-sixth as much. Therefore, you will only weigh one-sixth as much. And your muscles, of course, are going to be just as strong. So you would be able to push your weight around a lot easier. You'd be able to jump higher, throw balls further, everything, because your muscles are just as strong. Things would fall on the moon. Like if you threw a rock up in the air, it would come back down, but it wouldn't fall at the same rate that it would fall on Earth. It would fall much slower and you could probably fall off a higher cliff and survive because you wouldn't hit the moon's surface with as much force. Some other interesting thing is because the gravity is only one-sixth as much, the atmosphere on the moon is almost non-existent. It's almost a pure vacuum. There hasn't been enough gravitational force to hold these gas molecules to the moon's surface, so they've all flown out into space. As a result of no atmosphere, then an observer on the moon can look out into space and see black sky all the time, even when the sun's out. They can see the sun and the stars out at the same time. And of course there's no weather on the moon, there's no winds, and if you've ever seen those flags that are planted, those American flags, well those are special L-shaped flagpoles to make it look like the flag is blowing in the breeze. Another interesting fact, because the moon has no atmosphere, there's extreme temperatures. On the sunny side of the moon, it gets up to 100 degrees C. That's the boiling point of water. And on the dark side of the moon, it gets down to minus 150 degrees C. So you always notice that when the astronauts land, they're usually landing in the shadow zone where it's some type of in-between reasonable temperature that their spacesuits can accommodate. Also, there's no magnetic field on the moon, so a magnetic compass wouldn't work, so they need to navigate by different means. Now, you can ask your students if certain pieces of equipment that we're used to would operate properly on the moon, like would a match burn, would a helium balloon float, uh, would a gasoline engine work? Why do they use those electric engines and those little rovers? Asking questions like that is a good way to get your students to learn the characteristics of the moon. Incidentally, the moon is about 250,000 miles away, a quarter of a million miles away from the Earth. Now, the phases of the moon. And we know that the moon is going around the Earth, but we're not really sure whether it's going around clockwise or counterclockwise. It goes around once in 28 days. So it starts here. One week later, it'll go on one quarter of the way around. Two weeks from the beginning, it'll be here. Three weeks, it'll be here. And then four weeks, or 28 days later, it'll be back here. If it goes 360 degrees, a complete circle, in 28 days, how many degrees will it move in one day? 
Well, this is a simple division problem and it comes out to be about 12 degrees. So if it's here today, it will have moved 12 degrees along in its journey by tomorrow. And then another 12 degrees. Now, let's use this motion of the Earth turning with these little paper people to try and make a decision about which way the moon is going, counterclockwise or clockwise. Let's say it's here today. One day passes, it's now here, 12 degrees away, and the Earth turns counterclockwise on its axis. Now let's think about this little girl in New York. What will she see rise first? Will it be the sun or will it be the moon? And if you can't grasp that yet, let's let another day pass where the moon is over here. Which one will she see rise up in the east first as the Earth turns around? It'll be the sun first, and then a few hours later, it'll be the moon. Okay, now, the next day, if the moon is moving this way in a counterclockwise fashion, at the same time of day when she thought the moon should be rising, if she looked at the exact same time, she'll see that the moon isn't there. It hasn't come up yet. And she's going to have to wait a little bit longer for the Earth to turn that little bit more so she can see the moon rising. So the moon will appear to be rising later each day. Now what if it's going this way? clockwise. Well, let's say it's here today, it's here the next day, now it's over here, and here's our girl in New York. What's she going to see rise in the east first? Will it be the moon or the sun? Well, this time it's going to be the moon rising first. And one day later, the moon will be here. And will the moon appear to be rising earlier or later? Well, she's going to see the moon rising earlier now. Now that we got the groundwork set, and your students understand how this model works, you want to send them outside and have them start observing the moon. The rising time of the moon or note the position of the moon in the sky and then look at the same time the next night and see if the moon is there or whether it takes another hour or 50 minutes or so for the moon to get up there. And they should deduce from their actual observations that the moon can only be going in a counterclockwise fashion around the earth. We turn back to the model if necessary and have the students look at it once again. Above all, let them figure out the answer to this problem. Now let's go on and take a look at the phases of the moon. And we'll start with the moon being right here, directly between the sun and the earth. This is called a new moon phase. And in fact, I used to think that the dark side of the moon or the back side of the moon was always dark. You could never see any light on it. But when the moon is new, as you see in this position, all we have to do is fly a satellite around the back side and take all the pictures we want to see what it looks like, even though we can't see this side from Earth. It turns out that the back side of the moon is really quite different than the side that we see. This side has all those things that we called seas, those big volcanic plains. And back over here there's practically none of those. It's mostly just craters. Now the moon travels once around the Earth in 28 days. So it's here today. It'll take 28 days to go one complete revolution around the Earth. One week from new moon, it'll be in this position. So it goes from an all dark moon to a little light, more light, more light, more light, and finally it's half lit. Light on the right, dark on the left. This is called a first quarter and the moon is waxing on this side. It's getting brighter each night. As the Earth turns in this position, our observer in New York, at noontime, when the sun is directly overhead, will see in the east this first quarter moon rise. And at 6 p.m., this first quarter moon will be directly overhead. And at midnight, this first quarter moon will set. Another week later, it's waxing more and more each night, and eventually we get to this gibbous state here where there's a little sliver of darkness. I guess the darkness will be over here on the left side, and then it gets to full. And the sun and the earth and the moon are directly lined up. And on a full moon, our observer, this one in Tokyo, will see the full moon rise in the east at the same time the sun sets in the west. So full moons rise at sunset. And a full moon will be directly overhead at midnight. And the same full moon will set in the west when the sun's rising in the east. Now, another week passes and now the moon's starting to wane. It's losing light. 
and as it continues around here, it gets less light and less light and less light on it, and it goes through that gibbous stage again where it's kind of hunchbacked. And then it gets over here, and our observer will see it's dark on the right-hand side this time and light on the left-hand side, and this particular moon is directly overhead at sunrise, and at noontime, when the sun's directly overhead, this third quarter moon will be setting. And then as it continues to wane more and more and more, we now have the crescent stages where you're just seeing a sliver of light. And eventually it goes back to new moon 28 days into the cycle. Another topic to cover are lunar and solar eclipses. And, but before we get to that, let's talk about two words, perigee and apogee. And I like to teach these two words to my students with a pear and an apple. You hold one close to your face and you hold one further out. Perigee is when the object is closest to you. And apogee, and they'll probably call it apogee, is when the object is further away. Now, using those words and thinking of the moon now, the moon isn't completely circular in orbit. Sometimes it's 250,000 miles away from the Earth. Sometimes it's 220,000 miles away. Perigee. And if it's in perigee and new at the same time, then the shadow behind the moon, the shadow that's cast by the moon, will hit the Earth and will make a little circular spot. And remember the Earth is turning on its axis. And as it turns, that little spot will appear to be zooming across the Earth at maybe seven or 800 miles an hour, maybe 1,000 miles an hour. And if you happen to be fortunate enough to be on a geographic location as that spot zooms by you, for a few minutes, it will appear that the sun is completely blocked out by the moon, and it'll get dark, and you'll be able to see the stars out at the same time. And they actually can follow the spot in an airplane and stay right in it for longer periods of time. This is a solar eclipse, and it's very rare. I've never seen one myself. It's rare to be actually in that spot. If you ever have the opportunity, be sure and go out and look for it. The other kind of eclipse is the lunar eclipse, and it happens only during a full moon. And what is happening here is the moon is dropping inside the shadow of the Earth. So it's going into perigee here now, and it's getting inside the Earth's shadow. So you see the shadow of the Earth first come across it, and then it moves in and gets darker and darker. And you can actually see the atmosphere of the Earth on the moon, like a screen of a movie screen. And it's a very interesting sight in itself. Lunar eclipses last for maybe 20 minutes, and in fact, thousands of years ago, Greek astronomers realized that the Earth was really round because they noticed, they realized that they were really looking at the, the shadow of the Earth on the moon long before Columbus said that the Earth was round. Now, there's at least four eclipses every year, combination of two solar and two lunar, and there may be as many as seven eclipses, solar and lunar eclipses each year. What you want to do is look in a sky ch calendar or a star chart or something to find out when these eclipses are occurring and see if you're fortunate enough to be in the right region at the right time to see it. Remember also, and you should tell your students this, not to look at an eclipse directly. You never want to look at the sun with the naked eye. And there's ways that we can view eclipses and actually look at the sun in an indirect means. We'll show you later in this course. Now let's take a look at the planets. And one thing you want your students to learn is to be able to name the nine planets from Mercury out to Pluto. And I like to use this little memory aid. First I tell my students, if I give you the first letter of each planet's name in order, can you then name the planet? They usually say yes, except for the two M planets, Mercury and Mars. And then I say, okay, close your eyes and picture this. A little girl whose name is Mary Valentine, and she's eating moldy jelly. She's got this little jar of jelly with mold growing all over it, and she's sitting there eating it and going yuck as she takes every bite. So I say, all you have to remember is Mary Valentine eats moldy jelly. And you got the first five planets right there. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter. Then the next three planets, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, just happen to spell the word sun. That's interesting. And the last planet out everybody knows is Pluto. Learning aids like this make learning fun. Now let's take a look at a year. And what does a year mean? Well, on our planet Earth, a year is 365 days, the time it takes to go once around the sun. The planets that are closer to the sun 
have different times for a year. Mercury goes around the Sun in 88 days. Venus goes around the Sun in 225 days. Mars outside the orbit of the Earth takes 700 days and I think Jupiter out there takes 12 years. Pluto, the furthest planet out, takes 250 years to go once around the Sun. Now think of this, here's Venus and it sits out here in orbit going around the Sun. Let's say it's right here right now so it's making a 90 degree angle with the Earth. And let's think about our little girl here again in New York. And as the Earth is turning, what will she see rise in the east first? Will it be Venus or will it be the Sun as the Earth turns? Well, it will be Venus. She'll see Venus an hour or two before sunrise. And Venus is a very reflective object and it reflects light like our moon does. And it's going to be very close to sunrise in the east and it's going to reflect a lot of light and it's called the morning star. It's the brightest object in the sky except for the moon in this particular position. And then of course as the sun comes up the sky gets bright and you can't see Venus anymore. Some hundred and so days later Venus is now over here on this side of the orbit and let's make it make a 90 degree angle again and now look at what happens as the earth turns our girl in New York comes around she'll see the sun rise first so the sky will be all blue by the time Venus rises and she won't see Venus rise but look at what happens at sunset sunset first she'll see the sunset in the west and then a couple hours later she'll see Venus set so this means that for the short period of time from after sunset until Venus sets, she's going to see a very brilliant object in the western sky, very close to the horizon, right near the sun. This is Venus as the evening star. And I'm told that you can see Mercury too, although it's closer to the sun, so you have to make sure that you look just a few minutes before sunrise or just a few minutes after sunset when you're looking for that. Now the other planets, the outside planets, there's many visible planets out here too. Mars is a perfect example, the red planet, because it has red soil and it's reflecting light from the sun also. Mars, because it's an outside planet, can be seen anywhere in the sky. In this particular position, an observer would see it at midnight looking out into space over in this direction. If Mars happened to be over here in orbit, the observer would be looking out over here. So it really can be anywhere. Except if Mars happens to be on this side of the sun, then the sun will of course block out the view of Mars because of the light. The other planets that you can see are Jupiter, and if you have a pair of binoculars, you can actually see maybe four of Jupiter's moons. And Saturn is also a visible planet. Now because these planets wander around in the heavens, the best way to find out where they're located at the present time is to look them up in a sky calendar. And they have a really good sky calendar in the monthly editions of Science and Children magazine. Now some other topics that you need to cover. Characteristics of the Sun and the Moon and characteristics of some of the planets and what the difference is between comets and meteors. And comets are really interesting objects in the sky. Let's take a look at what they are right now. The word comet means long hair in Latin. But when a comet is far from the Sun, it has no long hair or tail. It can be described as a dirty iceberg consisting of a solid nucleus, which is very porous and made mostly of frozen gases, ices, rocks, and fine dust. The diameter of most comets is from 1 to 30 miles. As the comet approaches the sun, the outer surfaces of the nucleus get hot and vaporize. Gases and very tiny dust particles form around the nucleus. This is called the coma, or head of the comet. This material spreads out and gives the comet an apparent diameter of perhaps 100,000 miles. It may be larger than the planet Jupiter. It's natural to suppose that a comet moves head first with its tail streaming out behind it, but this is not true. The radiation and outrushing of gases from the sun pushes on this material and forces it to point in a direction away from the sun. This is the tail, and although it may extend outward for a hundred million miles into space, there's so very little material that the entire tail could be packed into a suitcase. Comets are visible only when close to the sun. The light from a comet is, in part, reflected sunlight and also caused by excited gas molecules similar to a glowing neon or fluorescent light. 
the best time to view a comet is just before sunrise or just after sunset. The path of a comet is quite different from the nearly circular planetary orbit. Sometimes the orbit is a long, narrow ellipse with one point in the outer edge of the solar system. Other comets may follow an open curve called a parabola or a hyperbola. In these cases, it would only pass our sun once, never to return. Halley's Comet travels in an elliptical orbit and is very eccentric. This means that the perigee distance is very small compared to the apogee distance. This comet, which orbits our sun every 76 years, has been seen 28 times since the year 240 BC. It was the same famous comet of 1066 during the Norman conquest of England. Halley's Comet was at apogee, beyond the orbit of Neptune in 1948, and after passing the Sun in 1986, will not return again until the year 2062. Now we want to investigate another motion in the solar system, and that's the movement of the Earth in orbit around the Sun. That trip, that journey that takes 365 days. Think of yourself as as moving along through space. You're turning this way and you're traveling at a certain speed and uh, if you're in the United States you're probably traveling at about 700 miles an hour. If you're down at the equator you're traveling at a thousand miles an hour. It's like a record that's squished down flat looking down onto this record. A person on the North Pole would just make a turn and the person out at the equator would be going the fastest. But besides that you're also traveling around this way you're orbiting the Sun in space. And I believe the Earth travels at about 20 miles a second. One second it moves 20 miles through space. And this is the motion that we want to look at now, the movement of the Earth around the Sun. The Earth sits out in space, tilted at 23 and a half degrees. This angle of tilt always remains the same. In other words, it doesn't tilt back and forth from one season to the next. Because of this tilt, we get more direct sunlight in the southern hemisphere in January or the winter time for us and then six months later when the Earth is around here in the orbit we get more direct sunlight in the northern hemisphere and less direct in the, su in the southern and you can show this with a flashlight by shining the beam seeing a more direct beam here and a, and a more spread out beam here and then when you're back in January again using the same flashlight you can see the same effect. So this is an explanation about what causes the seasons if people need to know why there's winter and summer. Why isn't it just rain sometimes and cold and clear and just kind of a general medium weather? We would have weather if the earth sat straight up and down but we wouldn't have seasons and that's an important difference. So the Earth is sitting out here in space. And let's think of stars now. This is a really interesting idea. Here's our fellow here in Turkey coming around. And in January, it's midnight, and he's looking out and seeing all these stars out here, all these stars in this star field here. And then during the daytime, he can't see any stars because the sun's out. But look what happens to him six months later when he's over here. The Earth is turning on its axis daily. And our fellow here can now not see any of those stars because it's daylight. And then as the day passes and the nighttime begins, he starts to see all these stars out in this star field. And the only stars that you can see all year around as the Earth goes around and around, the only ones you can see are the stars that are up there the ones up above us, and they kind of go around in circles because that's what we're doing. The Big Dipper, you can see pretty much throughout the year. Sometimes it's up in the early morning hours, sometimes it's up in the early evening hours. But you can almost see it every night if you're up at the right time. The North Star is an extension of the axis of the Earth. And that's why sighting at it gives us the angle of our latitude. So there's stars all out there 
And there's constellations that we can see only in the wintertime, and there's constellations that we can see only in the summertime, and there's spring constellations and there's fall constellations, which are the stars out where you are, and the stars over here. It's important that we see that there's winter constellations and summer constellations. And it's important that your students understand why, with the model of the Earth going around the sun. Solar eclipses occur all the time, and people just don't really know they're happening. You can look in sky calendars to find out when they're happening. Most of them are only partial eclipses, so we don't really notice the less light that's shining down on us that was blocked by the moon. But if you do want to view an eclipse, a total or even a partial eclipse, this is the best piece of equipment to use. A piece of clay, a clothespin, and a very tiny piece of mirror about the size of a fingernail or smaller. Only with a mirror this small can you project a circular image of the sun. As the mirror gets bigger, the image gets blurred. Now there's a bunch of things you can do with this. One, you can project a solar eclipse into your classroom. If the sun's over this way and your room's over here, fortunately for you, you can bounce that beam of sun right in through your window and observe it on the wall in the classroom. You can have your students take these little devices outside and set up a piece of butcher paper in front of them and project, set it, and, and trace the image of the sun. And without touching this, come back and at 15 minute or 20 minute intervals, make another tracing and make comparisons and, and start to understand that the Earth really is turning. You must remember that when you're observing the sun, you must look at the sun indirectly because it's unsafe to view the sun directly through unexposed film or smoked glass. The ultraviolet rays still pass through. When you're talking about astronomy at the intermediate grade levels, you're going to have to eventually get into what are degrees and how to measure degrees. So it's all, I guess, part of the math course too. Some of the things I like to do in measuring degrees is we know that the Earth turns 360 degrees in 24 hours. So if you divide 24 into 360, you'll find out how many degrees it goes in one hour. It comes out to be 15 degrees. So 15 degrees is equal to one hour of movement in the sky. Now it just so happens that every one of you has a way of measuring degrees and you carry them with you every day, your fists. If you hold your outstretched arm and you lay one fist on top of the other, you're approximating an angle of 15 degrees. So let's say the sun was up there in the sky somewhere and you wanted to know what time sunset was or how many hours until sunset. Say you were on a hike and you wanted to get back to camp in time. Could be a good survival lesson too. Hold your outstretched arm from the horizon and you go, there's one hour, there's two hours, there's three hours. Double fist, you carry a half an hour in each hand, you got 15 degrees. Once your students have mastered the fist measurement of degrees, they're ready for the Cadillac model. This is called a quadrant and it's real easy to build. A piece of cardboard circumscribed with zero degrees at the bottom using a protractor zero degrees at the bottom. I've got 10 degree increments here. It goes up to 90 this way and it goes up to 90 this way. Then you want to draw a straight line across and you want to tape a soda straw onto it so it's perfectly perpendicular to this line. It has to be flat so that when you're sighting zero degrees this little string and nut will say zero degrees. As your student tries to do experiments to see certain angles, say Polaris, the North Star. If they measure the angle of Polaris, they look up and sight it at night. They press the string next to it and they read off the number of degrees. That number should equal their latitude and they can check it by looking at a globe. And here's the perfect opportunity for you to do an experiment, get your kids involved. Have each student go out at night and measure the angle to Polaris and come in the next day and record the data so the students can see all the different values that their fellow students got. And then start looking at the data and saying what's the highest number, what's the lowest part number, what's the average, what is the best guess, who got the most, which number scored the most, different things. Doing some mathematical operations, simple ones, getting your kids involved with an experiment and learning how to experiment using a simple device like this, the quadrant. At the primary level, the student probably did a simple activity of measuring the sun's angle using a soda straw and a piece of clay. 
we're going to take the same idea and go one step further and find out the actual value of that angle using this simple measuring device. What the students do, you treat this as an experiment. They each make their own little quadrant. They go outside in pairs and they make two observations. Each student records the angle of the sun with their quadrant. Now the way to do it, you have to stress not to look through the straw at the sun. Obviously it's not good to look at the sun and there's a good place for safety to come in. Hold their hand under the straw and you can see it really good when you get just perfectly lined up. You're going to see a perfect circle of the sun going right through the straw and shining on your hand. When you get to that point, the lab partner will read off the value of the angle and they'll record it. And then the lab partner will do the experiment and they'll switch roles. When they all come back in the class after making their measurement, it's important to record the time of day, too. When they come back in, you can put all the numbers on the board, you can treat it, uh, find averages, you can do lots of mathematical operations on it. You can look at the highest number and the lowest value. You can talk about error. What were some of the reasons that might have caused error in this experiment? It's a really great experiment because as the year goes on, the angle of the sun will change. And of course, in the winter months, January and December, the angle is the lowest in the sky at noontime. And in the summer months, June and July, the angle would be the highest. If you have the opportunity to start an astronomy lesson early in the year, you can start doing this activity, recording the angle once every two weeks or once a month, and maybe carry it through for six months. It's a real good activity. The kids enjoy it, and it gives you the opportunity to teach angles and mathematics. When your students get more involved in some of the star groups and constellations, you may want to show them this activity. It involves getting a paper towel tube, a piece of aluminum foil, and a rubber band. The students taking a pin will poke little tiny holes in the aluminum foil to make a constellation that they wish to view, one they may have seen or one they'd like to see. And then they fold the piece of aluminum foil over the paper towel tube like I've done here. It's important to mark up and down when you view it into the light so you can tell which way it should be. Some constellations when they rise in the east they look like they're on their side and then when they come overhead they turn or they appear to turn 90 degrees. So you may want to bring those ideas out. You might see the constellation in the east one way and in the west another way and overhead a third way. But by using these constellation viewers, you can get a really good approximation of some of our constellations in the night sky. Here's the example that I have, Orion. To find your way amongst the many stars in the evening sky, it's best to choose a familiar constellation as a starting point and gradually work your way from one star group to another. At the primary level, we became familiar with Orion, a very conspicuous winter constellation. Let us use Orion as a starting point. First, it's important that Orion is high in the sky. A good time for this activity is mid-February at 9 p.m., mid-March at 8 p.m., or mid-April at 7 p.m. Following down from the belt stars of Orion, we can easily find Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky. Sirius belongs to the constellation Canis Major, or the Big Dog, which follows on Orion's heels. Forming an equilateral triangle with Betelgeuse, Orion's right hand, is Procyon, another very bright star, in the constellation of Canis Minor, or the Little Dog. Higher in the sky, between Orion and the little dog, we find Gemini, the twins, with Castor on the right and Pollux on the left. Looking now to the right of Orion, we see a prominent V in the sky. This is the head of Taurus the bull, who is charging Orion. If you look closely, you may see Orion's shield between these two constellations. Further on, we find a beautiful cluster of stars that make a tiny little dipper. These are part of Taurus the Bull and are called the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters. These are very young stars, and although we only see six in this cluster, with a telescope we see that there are really about 600. Observing the stars is interesting and fun. 
All you need is a good map and a clear evening.